morning, everybody. We are going to start our morning session today, and Slava is going to give her his third lecture. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we stopped uh, last time our, our discussion at the subject of conformal blocks. Uh, so that's where I start. That's where I start. Uh, so remember, we said that uh, we are considering uh, a four-point function. which I can express by doing the OPE of two operators and two operators. So I get it as a sum uh, f1 to k, f3 for k. And then here is some differential operator, which acts at the operator ok at the point x2. And there's also another differential operator which acts uh, at the operator OK at the point X4. And uh, this thing here can be expressed, I said, as a, as a certain function, uh, G delta K LK, which depends on the cross ratios, divided by some um, kinematical factor, some x12 to some power, x34 to some power, some trivial factor here. And so this function here is called conformal block. Conformal block. And by the way, sometimes this whole thing, this whole thing, including this kinematical factor, is called conformal partial wave. So conformal block is a, is a part of the conformal partial wave, which depends on u and v. And uh, uh, so I would like to discuss how uh, one can compute these conformal blocks. And uh, uh, there is a certain differential equation. There's a, there's a, there's a differential equation, which is called Casimir uh, differential equation, the partial differential equation, which this conformal block satisfies. Uh, so I'd like to explain how this come about. <clears throat> and uh, um, so this has group theoretic origin, this equation, see Casimir. And uh, to derive it, we have to first of all uh, recall that uh, so we have, a, we have a, as I said, we have conformal group, we have conformal algebra. which is SO d plus one comma one. And it has generators P mu, uh, M mu nu, a dilatation generator D, and uh, special conformal transformations generator K mu. This is all there is in, in D dimensions. And uh, so each of these operators gives rise uh, to a word identity expressing invariance of a correlation function under this generator. So, so this word identity has, so let me call all of these generators LA. Uh, so the word identity has the form. So if you have a if you have a correlation function, let me say, okay, let's take the same correlation function as there. There and then, so the word identity says that L a acting on this correlation function uh, equals zero. But uh, what that means in practice is that you have to have take a sum of the following form. So you take L a uh, acting on the first operator, O one x one. Or two x two dot 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 plus or one x one la or two x two dot dot dot. So if you take the sum of all these terms, uh, it it gives you zero. This is the word identity. And so each one of these things 
appearing in this word identity is a differential operator, okay, first order differential operator. So, I mean, uh, for example, if LA is equal P mu, then this equation expresses infinitesimally the fact that the correlation function is translationally invariant. Right? So if you put there a dilatation generator, then this just expresses that the correlation function is uh, transforms correctly under dilatations. So this is the infinitesimal form of, of the fact that the correlation function is conformally invariant. So, uh, so each of these operators can be worked out. So for some of them, it's, uh, it's uh, for some of them, it's of course uh, well known. Yeah, for example, uh, you know, the, the P mu acting on any operator O of X, this just gives uh, up, to, up to some signs and I's, it just gives D mu O of X, right? That's then dilatation generator acting on O of X, it gives uh, X mu D mu plus the scaling dimension of operator. Uh, acting on O of X. So there are such rules. Uh, the most complicated of these rules is, uh, is the action of K mu, is the action of K mu on O of X. Let me write it down. So it's equal to uh, two X mu X D uh, minus X squared D mu and then there is a part plus 2x mu delta uh, plus uh, 2x lambda sigma mu nu acting on the operator O of x. Where, okay, th this is, if you're familiar, this is the uh, the vector field corresponding to special conformal transformations, infinitesimal special conformal transformation, then there's a part proportional to scaling dimension, and then there is this matrix which acts on the, uh, on, acts on the spin indices. Acts on the spin indices. But in any case, so there are such formulas that, that you can look up for each generator of the algebra. Uh, and uh, so we have the conformal invariance of the correlation function expressed in this form, but we also have the conformal invariance of the OPE. So I was, uh, I was discussing, so this OPE, which is written there, So let me write it again, uh, O1x1, O2x2 equals uh, sum over k, uh, F1 to k, P, k of x2. So this OP is also conformally invariant which means that if you take this OP and if you act on it on any of these LAs and acting on it with LAs just means take, uh, act with LA on O1 using one of these first order differential operator plus act with LA on O2. The result of this operation has to be equal to acting with LA on OK. So this equation 
so, the, express, so this equation expresses conformal invariance of the OP. And actually, uh, so yesterday we were discussing how to determine uh, this infinite expansion, this, this infinite expansion in derivative of P. And I said one way to determine it is to match with the three-point function. But another way to determine this expansion is just to enforce this property. That you can commute LA, you can push LA through from acting on the left-hand side of the OPE to acting on the right-hand side of the OPE. So this property, uh, this property is very important. And actually, this property guarantees that if you, so if, if you start from this property, and you say, well, now I'm going to use OPE to compute uh, three-point functions, four-point functions, and so on, by repeatedly using the OPE, it's going to guarantee for you, I'm not sure, okay, if you don't see it, then think about this, that it will guarantee for you that the correlation function that you get in the end of the day are going to be conformally invariant. This property is necessary to guarantee that the correlation functions that you compute using the OP are conformally invariant. Yes? Uh, P, because, because P here is just, uh, well, it's not guaranteed. I'm telling you that this P has to be determined in a way that you should be allowed to, to, to do this uh, procedure. Not guaranteed. If you take precisely the separator P contains derivatives, and L also contains derivatives, so if you take whatever P you, you want, this is not going to be true, definitely. So playing for very specific P's is going to be true. Any other questions? So uh, So this is the conformal algebra. And now, uh, and now we can do the following trick. Take the conformal block. Take the conformal block. So let me express, express here. Conformal block is individual term where I just, I do not sum over k's, but, but here I, I take one particular k. So this is conform block, or let's say conform a partial wave, everything. And now I'm going to act on this conformal block with a particular operator. Uh, so I'm going to act on it with yeah, I'm, going, I'm going to act on this on this operator with uh, LA acting at the point one plus LA acting at the point two. Well, actually this LA acting at the point one, LA put put two, it means really LA uh, acting on O1, X1, O2, X2. So by the conformal invariance of the OPE, the result of this action, so this action is the first order differential operator. So the result of this action is going to be equivalent to pushing this LA generator, so this is going to be equivalent to acting with LA on, a, on OK. So I'm just explaining in words this, uh, this equation here.
But now let me do it the second time. So let me act, so now act the second time. So I'm considering a differential operator of the form d equals uh, sum over a la1 plus la2 squared. So this is, this is because I'm, I'm going for the Casimir. So you see, I'm considering the quadratic Casimir. But in, you see, it's a Casimir. But here I'm considering an operator which is a sum of two differential operators, one acting at the point x1, one acting at the point x2. But each of these operators can be pushed to act on, a, on OK. So this is going to be equivalent uh, to acting with Casimir. So with uh, sum over a la squared on OK. But uh, here we go, because so, so, OK, this operator was a complicated operator. It was acting at two different points. But here I already have an operator which acts on one point and is applied to this operator OK sitting at this point. And here, uh, you know, we, we just have uh, a basic uh, theory of group representation. So if you have a quadratic Casimir of a group acting on uh, any representation, it's going to give us the same operator times a constant. So there's going to be an eigenvalue so this, this is going to be equal to some eigenvalue, C delta L, uh, times OK. And this, this eigenvalue can be worked out. It's um, something like uh, delta times uh, delta plus D minus 2. No, it's, sorry, it's uh, delta times uh, delta minus D plus uh, L times L plus D minus 2. So what did we prove? We... So this, this argument explains that there is a second order differential operator. It's this one, this operator D. That if you apply it to a conformal partial wave, you are going to get the same conformal partial wave back up to a constant. So we showed that the conformal partial wave satisfies an eigenvalue equation. So uh, here we go. Now you have to work out this equation. And uh, you have to solve it, and this way you're going to find the conformal partial waves. So this, uh, and you still have to think how to organize this computation, how to find this operator. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, where, um, so the nicest way to organize this computation is to use the so-called um, projective Nalcon formalism. I think I, I don't have time to talk about. But since, uh, according to the survey, it's something that, uh, uh, that not many of you are familiar with. So it's a formalism which allows, uh, so let me just say a few words. So in this formalism, you're, lift the correlation function of a conformal field theory, which are defined in d-dimensional Euclidean space, you can lift this, um, these correlation functions uh, to a cone in d plus two-dimensional space. And the advantage of this thing is that on the cone, when you lift the correlation functions to the cone, uh, the conformal group, which acts on the Euclidean space in a somewhat complicated way, in particular the special conformal generator. When you lift it to the cone, uh, the conformal group acts on the cone linearly because the conformal group is just the Lorentz group of the d plus two dimensional space. 
And on the cone, it is realized as the Lorentz group. And so in particular, all of these generators, LA, on the cone, they look just like the usual Lorentz group generators. And so it is very easy to work out the action of this operator. So you do all the computation on the cone, and then at the end, you go back to the Euclidean space. So I'll, I'll just uh, write down the answer for this operator, and it's instructive to, uh, to see, to just look at it a little bit. So it, it, So let me write this operator acting on functions. So yesterday I explained that we can parameterize equivalently conformal blocks. Uh, and we can parameterize everything for point functions, not in terms of u and v, but in terms of this variable z and z bar. So let me use these variables. So in terms of these variables, the operator has the following form. It has uh, a form which is factorized in ZZ bar minus Z squared EZ plus exactly the same thing with Z exchanged by Z bar. And then there is a second piece which vanishes in d equal to 2, so it's proportional to d minus 2, uh, zz bar divided by z minus z bar, and then uh, 1 minus z dz minus, uh, minus z going to z bar. So once uh, you do this complicated computation, you end up with this simple looking uh, differential operator. And so what do you see from here? So first of all, you see that in d equal to 2, this differential operator completely factorizes into something depending on z. So the equation that you're supposed to solve is that d minus uh, c delta l acting on the conformal block is 0. So that's the equation you have to solve. So in d equal to 2, you have factorization. So z, z bar factorize. And so your conformal blocks are going to be equal to some functions of z times some functions of z bar. I'm, I'm going to write these functions maybe in a second. So if you go to higher d, then there is this second term in, uh, in, the, in the equation which does not allow you to find the conformal blocks in a completely factorized form. So z, that's what I said. So we, we can use the variable z and z bar in any number of dimensions, but you are not going uh, to be able to take advantage of the factorization in higher dimensions. The dimensionalities should be even. Which, which dimensionalities? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. So, uh, in, in, In this equation, you consider z and z bar as independent variables. Usually, because the conformal block depends on two variables. You can call them x and y, and they call them z and z bar, but for the purposes of the differential equation, these are independent variables.
But of course, when you go back to, to evaluate the conformal blocks, then you're going to set Z equal Z bar complex conjugate. Any other questions? Well, maybe let, let me write down the formula. So in, in two dimensions, in D equal two, then uh, we can write the conformal blocks in the following form. G delta L is equal uh, to some function K, which depends on delta minus L of Z, uh, K delta plus L of Z bar plus uh, the interchange, where this function k beta of z, it's uh, z to the power beta over 2, uh, the hypergeometric function to f1 with arguments beta over 2, beta over 2, beta z. So this is such a nice explicit formula for which follows from just solving this in differential equation. Then in d equal to 4, is another interesting case, it turns out that you can, uh, you can also solve this equation. And the formula you get uh, looks as follows. Uh, Z, Z bar divided by Z minus Z bar. So you solve this equation by taking an ansatz. Let me, look the let me look for a solution in the form 1 over z minus z bar times something. And it turns out that this ansatz goes through and it gives you a factorized equation. So here you have uh, k delta uh, plus delta minus l uh, minus 2 uh, of z k delta plus L of Z bar plus Z going to Z bar minus Z going to Z bar. So uh, in uh, so in D equal two and D equal four dimensions, there are these nice formulas. In other dimensions, for example, in D equal three. Uh, there are no such uh, known nice formulas for the conformal blocks. And, uh, well, you should not be surprised uh, about it because it's known that even in odd dimensions, they often behave in a significantly different way. So what do we do then? Uh, well, uh, we found a very efficient way to generate um, power series expansions, which converge extremely rapidly for these conformal blocks. So from the practical point of view, we you know, when you're doing a numerical computation, you can just take advantage of these power series expansions. You expand the conformal blocks to some very, very high order, and then uh, you truncate. But still, it's, uh, you know, for numerical purposes, it's efficient, but maybe one day uh, somebody will find uh, a nice analytic way uh, to deal with these conformal blocks also in odd dimensions. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because you know I have a treatment. Yeah, so I should comment about that. So when we are in two dimensions, uh, in two dimensions there are two types of conformal blocks. There are the so-called big blocks and small blocks. And the small blocks are the blocks uh, where you are summing over the descendants corresponding to the global conformal symmetry generators. And these are the ones that I talk about here. But, and then there are big blocks where you are summing over the full Virasoro algebra. 
those are much more complicated objects, and particularly they depend on the central charge of the theory, and they do not have uh, any nice uh, closed form expression, even in two dimensions. So, so yes, yeah, these are the the small small conform blocks. Which, by the way, can be seen as the limits of big conformal blocks and in the limit of infinite central charge. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, sorry, I did not understand. Yeah. Yes? Um, yeah, so, so this equation needs to be supplemented by, by the conditions, by the initial conditions. So the question was how, uh, since it's a second differential order differential equation, how do I, um, you know, how do I fix the solution? Well, uh, first of all, I have to tell you the, the initial conditions for this equation, they They take the following form. So in the limit when z, uh, z bar going to zero, which is the limit when the two points collide. So in this limit, I can use the OPE in order to determine the leading term of the conformal block. And this leading term looks like uh, G delta L of z uh, is equal to uh, z, z bar the power delta over two times a polynomial, uh, some known polynomial, which expresses the angular dependence and depends on the spin of uh, z plus uh, z bar divided by uh, square root uh, z z bar. So this is the leading behavior. And then it turns out that uh, given this leading behavior and the differential equation, the solution is unique. So answering, even though it's a second-order differential equation, uh, the solution is unique. And you should not be surprised because this, the point z equal to 0 for this equation is a very special point. It's a singular point. The coefficients of the differential equation go to 0 at this point. The coefficient of the z squared goes to 0. So in such situation, you know, the equation is second order, but it may effectively, for the purpose of boundary conditions, behaves as a first order equation. The solution is unique. Okay. So I want to explain this. Uh, I want to explain this method to generate the, the convergent, fast convergent power series expansions for the conformal block, because this this will allow us also to touch upon some other techniques, some other techniques in this business. So series expansions. So uh, in order to understand the series expansions, the first thing we should recall is the radial quantization. So I'm, I'm again starting with this uh, correlation function of 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. So, so far, I was not discussing, uh, I was not really discussing the Hilbert space structure of my conformal field theory, but you know, those, of you, uh, those of you who are familiar with the two-dimensional CFT, they will remember that uh, one often considers radial quantization, which means that we pick, we pick some origin, okay, let's say point x equal to zero, and then there are these two points x1 and x2, and then we quantize our theory uh, on the spheres 
surrounding the origin. So we, 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 foliate our, we foliate our space by spheres surrounding the origin. And uh, okay, this is the appropriate thing to do in a conformal field theory because then we can view the dilatation generator as the Hamiltonian of this quantization procedure. And so when we uh, insert two points, say, okay, let's take a particular sphere, maybe of radius one. Uh, if you insert two points inside the sphere and two points outside the sphere, then uh, we can view such correlation function, O1, O2, O3, O4, as uh, in the radial quantization, we view it as a sum uh, of matrix elements, of products of matrix elements, O1, O2, which gives us a certain state psi, uh, psi O3, O4. Where the sum is over the, uh, the basis, the orthonormal basis of states living on this sphere. This is the radial quantization. And the nice thing about the radial quantization is that it works in two dimensions, but it also works in higher dimensional CFTs, completely analogously. So in particular, we have a state operator correspondence which says that this, the, that this states living on the sphere, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with local operators inserting at the origin. So the local operators. So these states can be generated by, uh, by some operator O uh, inserted at the origin acting on the vacuum. Or, uh, you know, this is, this is one state, if O is a primary, and then we have also to consider states uh, d mu O acting on the vacuum, uh, d mu d nu O acting on the vacuum, and so on. Uh, these are all possible states that exist on the sphere. For all pos if we take these states for all possible operators O, we get all states on the sphere. Now, uh, these states are not going to be, if, if you consider states in this basis, then in general they are not going to be uh, orthonormal. So, uh, so there's going to be some gram matrix with, between these states. If you, want to go, if you want to go to the orthonormal basis, we have to invert this gram matrix. And so we can write the following formula, that, that, the, that the conformal, uh, we are going to write the following formula, that the conformal partial wave corresponding uh, to an operator O, so if we exchange here, so here we want to sum over all states which are descendants of, of some operator O, okay, let me call it okay, as we usually we're calling it. But we also have to orthonormalize them. So, so this conformal partial wave of operator OK is going to be equal to, um, to, to well, let me write it like this, uh, O1 of O1, O2. And here I'm going to insert this new object that I'm defining, OK, O3, O4. Uh, and uh, this object, OK, is the sum over all states, uh, over all states of the form O, P mu O, P mu P mu O, and so on. I have here alpha, and here I'm inverting. So this is the gram matrix which I have to invert, uh, beta. So 
n alpha beta. Beta is the matrix of uh, inner products. Yes. How do we f how do we find the orthonormal basis inside this uh, multiplet? Is that the question? Yes. So uh, the, the, all this. So we, you have to take this basis in the natural uh, form, OK, demi OK, and so on. And now you have to orthonormalize the basis. In order to orthonormalize the basis, you compute the gram matrix, then you invert it, and uh, you, get a, you get an orthogonal, orthonormal basis. So let me introduce now uh, another coordinate. So I, I already introduced this coordinate z, but now I would like to introduce another coordinate. So in my coordinate z, I was inserting one point at the origin, one point at z, one, and infinity. So that was for the z coordinate. But now I would like to insert points symmetrically. I would like to insert uh, two points, I would like to introduce coordinate rho such that uh, there are going to be two points in my correlation function inserted symmetrically at rho and minus rho. And then uh, two other points I'm going to fix at one and minus one. The origin. So, uh, so this coordinate rho is going to be of absolute value less than one. So what I'm saying is that for any configuration of this type, I can find a conformal transformation, which is just going to move, to move points around, and I'm going to find a conformal transformation which will map this configuration to this configuration. This is always possible. And you can explicitly write such conformal transformation, and rho obtained in this form is going to be some function of z. So this function of z, uh, so rho of z is equal to z uh, divided by one plus square root one minus z squared. So the reason, so here I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking, for, for theoretical studies, this variable z is totally okay, it's totally convenient, but since uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to, to use the numerical analysis, it's uh, important to expand my conformal blocks uh, in a way which is going to lead to the most, uh, to the fastest convergent power series expansions. So what I'm saying here is that if you want to do a fast expansion, then it's much nicer to expand in the variable rho rather than in the variable z. I mean, if you take the full series, then these two expansions are going to be completely equivalent. But if you're going to truncate the expansion, then the expansion in the variable rho is going to, after truncation, give a much better approximation. And uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, one reason is that, uh, one naive reason is that rho is uh, always smaller than z, as you can see. Absolute value of rho is always smaller than absolute value of z. Uh, that's one reason. Uh, another reason is that uh, you can, um, uh, 
you can see that when you when you are going to truncate the expansion in the row variable, it will it will correspond to still keeping uh, an infinite number of terms, resumming an infinite number of terms uh, in the z variable. So you are you are going to be throwing out fewer terms if you expand in the row variable. So that's uh, so this is a uh, this is a nice coordinate. But uh, for, for numerical point of view, but also this nice co this coordinate is um, it also has some theoretical advantages because now since we inserted the points uh, symmetrically, you know we insert the points symmetrically. Now imagine that we are going to exchange. Well, here I have to draw, draw another picture. So now let's go, let's go back to this formula, right? So I would like to I would like to consider the matrix element. So I would like to consider the conformal block in these coordinates, and I would like to consider the matrix element where I have okay, I have two operators: one inserted at the point row, one inserted at the point minus row, and then I'm. Uh, uh, there's going to be some state psi, and I, let me take this state psi, which has a certain uh, scaling dimension delta and spin j. And then the other two operators are inserted at 1 and minus 1. So, uh, What I would like to claim is that, okay, the, is that this matrix element has a very particular dependence on rho. You know, given by the spin of this, by the state that we are going to exchange. So let me let me write down uh, let me write down the answer. So this uh, written in this form, this product uh, is going to uh, to depend on, so let me write rho as some r to the power e to the i, th I uh, phi. So I claim that this matrix element is going to uh, be proportional, so some constant, times r to the power delta, times a polynomial uh, cj of cosine phi, and actually, this polynomial is going to be not just an arbitrary polynomial, but it's going to be uh, the so-called Gegenbauer polynomial, Cj nu, where nu is equal uh, to d over 2 minus 1. Gegenbauer polynomial. So if you're not familiar with Gegenbauer polynomials, it's a generalization of, uh, of the Legendre polynomials from 3 to d dimensions. So, uh, of course, we are, we are all familiar with Legendre polynomials from quantum mechanics. So they describe uh, how uh, wave functions of uh, they describe wave functions of uh, states with fixed spin in quantum mechanics. Well, here we are doing uh, quantum mechanics of spin j in d dimensions, and what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is that a certain matrix element in this quantum mechanics is uh, just for group theoretical reasons, it has to be proportional to the, the angular dependence of this matrix element is completely fixed and is given by this Gegenbauer polynomial. So this is uh, analogous to, to the usual uh, rules of angular momentum in uh, the usual quantum mechanics. And this dependence on uh, on the scaling dimension of the field, it comes uh, also for, for similar dimensional reasons. So I, I realize that this is probably a bit sketchy, but let me write at least the end result, and uh, the derivation may be sketchy, but the end result you should be able to appreciate.
So the end result of this discussion in, is that the conformal block G delta L, uh, written, uh, you know, let me write as a function of rho, which is r to the power e phi, is going to have an expansion, going to be a power series, where I have to sum over n and j, going to be a double series. So n here is going to be the level. So it's going to be n equal 0, 1, 2, and so on. And the level means that I'm considering descendants of dimension uh, delta plus n. And so there's going to be some up to, there's going to be some coefficient, let me call it b and j, r to the power delta plus n, and Gegenbauer polynomial cj nu of cosine phi. So, so this formula, it, uh, it captures completely the, no, it tells you the natural basis of functions into which you are supposed to expand your conformal blocks. So th these, are, uh, these are the functions in which you are supposed to expand. And these coefficients, b and j, you, you have to determine them. So they are going to be some, uh, so these coefficients, b and j, are going to be some functions of, uh, of n, j, and delta, functions of delta, actually rational functions of delta. So this argument does not tell you what these functions are. You have to still uh, fix these functions. And one way to fix this function is to take this formula and plug it into the Casimir differential equation that we already discussed. So if you, you, know, you take this, you plug in the differential equation, and you order by order, you'll be able to fix all of these coefficients. That's uh, one way to do it, but there is actually a much more uh, efficient uh, way to do it. Uh, let me write, uh, actually, any questions about this formula? Sorry? J plus L. No, so, so okay, I did not explain what J is. So on every level N, you are going to have descendants of dimension delta plus N, uh, and of spin J, of spin j, which is going to range from, uh, from L minus n up to L plus n. So j is going to range from L minus n to L plus n. For any different operators. So let, let, me, let me tell you about one more result, probably the last one today, uh, to, today in the morning. So some recursion relations. Let me tell you about recursion relations. So um, let me write this conformal block, G delta L. Let me take out this factor R to the delta. And, uh, um, you know, and, and what remains, let me call it H delta L. Then it turns out that for the function H delta L, I have the following uh, recursion relation. H delta L is equal 
So H delta L is of, co is of course a function of R and, and phi. This is equal to H infinity L of R and phi. plus a sum over i ti divided by delta minus delta i r to the power ni h delta i plus ni li. And h infinity l is, is a known function. It's equal to, to, the, to the Gegenbauer polynomial, Cl nu of cosine phi, divided by 1 minus r squared uh, to the power nu, square root 1 plus r squared squared, minus 4 r squared cosine squared phi. Well, anyway, don't copy this formula. You can look it up in the notes. Uh, let me just explain you what this formula means. So this formula, it comes about by thinking what is the structure of the conformal block as a function of, uh, of the scaling dimension delta. So this formula tells you that conformal block as a function of delta has a series of poles. You know, these are delta minus delta i. These are the poles in delta. And you know, if you know the positions of all the poles, and if you know their residues, then you can reconstruct the full function, right? So you, you have to know the limit of the conformal block when delta goes to infinity. This you can figure out pretty easily by solving the differential equation in this limit. Uh, you still have to know the positions of the poles, the coefficients, and here you see something interesting happens. So here, uh, no, here what I'm telling you, what this equation tells you is that if the conformal block uh, has a pole for certain value of delta, then the residue of this pole is also uh, is also a conformal block. So this uh, actually uh, you can you can easily understand from from the. Um, from again, from the differential equation, from the Casimir differential equation. So if you take, uh, you, you, you take this whole formula and you substitute it into, so this formula has to substitute the Casimir, has to satisfy the Casimir differential equation. But near the pole, this term dominates. So everything else you can forget about. So it means that the coefficient of this, of this pole satisfies by itself the Casimir differential equation. So it is the conformal block, right? So this is not so, uh, this is not so surprising. Now, uh, what is the origin of the poles? And what are these coefficients? So the origin of the poles you can understand by, uh, by looking at this formula. See, here, uh, I told you that in order to compute the conformal block, you have to invert this gram matrix. Generically, this gram matrix is going to be positive definite and inverting it is no problem. But for some very specific values of dimensions, this gram matrix is going to be degenerate. And when you invert it, you are going to get a pole, so for these values of dimension, the conformal block is going to have a pole. So uh, you, can, uh, you can work out for which dimensions this happens. Now, of course, the dimensions for which this is going to happen are not going to be the physical dimensions that uh, occur in, 
uh, in a real conformal field theory. So, so all of this, so in, in a real conformal field theory, all the dimensions in which we are interested are going to be positive, but the dimensions for which the poles occur, they're going to be negative. So these are unphysical dimensions, but you can formally consider the conformal block also for negative dimensions. It's an analytic function of delta. You can consider it also for negative dimensions. And this formula tells you that for negative dimensions, there are all these poles. So you can, you can uh, work out the positions of the poles, and you can work out also these coefficients. So these coefficients, ci, uh, they are, um, I mean, they are more complicated to work out, but uh, you, can, you can work them out in several ways, either by matching with the Casimir differential equation or directly. So all of these things have been worked out, but now, you know, once you have this formula, this formula is an ideal method to generate uh, this power series expansion. Because, you see, suppose that you want to compute a conformal block in that expansion. So you start with the first term. Then you have these poles. You see, each pole, it buys you. So all these numbers ni, they are positive numbers. So actually positive and growing. So it's a, it's a growing sequence of positive numbers. So each term here buys you several powers of r. So you, are, so you are using this recursion relation, you push the cutoff in R higher and higher. So once you apply it several times, you can, uh, you can generate uh, you know, the terms that you don't know, they get pushed to higher and higher orders in R. And so you know, if you are interested uh, in generating uh, this power series expansion up to order 100, well, it just means that you have to apply this recursion relation 100 times, and, uh, and that's it. So actually, uh, this uh, recursion relation about which you can also read in the notes, it's the most efficient currently uh, known way to generate, uh, to generate the coefficients b and j. OK, so I think that's all I wanted to say about the conformal blocks. Uh, I hope I convinced you that we have many uh, handles to compute them, at least numerically. And uh, in my second lecture today, I will show you how, how you can put them to use and get some results about conformal theories.